In the last episode, I discussed the failed attack on engineering. Now, we'll be delving a bit into the aftermath of that failure, as well as some of the implications of what the movie is trying to tell us. For all intents and purposes, the next 10 minutes of the movie is educating characters who are confused about what's going on, teasing a new threat to the Enterprise crew, and setting up the next phase of the movie. For those who are interested, we've had our first major failure and a lull into the second act, which will ultimately result in the rising action. Let's get into it. My name is Jean-Luc Picard. No! Who are you with? What faction? I'm not a member of the Eastern Coalition. Listen. I said is... shut up! I don't care who you're with. Get me the hell out of here. Now! That isn't going to be easy. Well, you better find a way to make it easy, soldier, or I'm going to start pushing buttons. All right. Follow me. Slow! As the security forces attempted to escape, Picard would enter into a hatch, closing it behind him. The Borg, instead of attempting to open said hatch, would begin sawing into the bulkhead. I guess they figured opening it up by hand or shooting it with a phaser just wasn't all that sporting. The captain is ultimately on his way when he is attacked. He gut punches Lily, but she is able to get a hold of his weapon, which, as soon as it hits the ground, is changed to kill. Even though we can quite clearly already see that it's set to kill when he enters the hatch, but... All right. She questions Picard, reasonably assuming that he is from an enemy nation, and he says he'll help her. The one thing I really do enjoy about this scene is Picard. He's initially confused and doesn't know how the hell she got where she is, but as soon as his confusion escalates her emotionally, he immediately tries to de-escalate. His hands coming up and palms going out, showing that he's given up. You really feel like she has a deadly weapon and he's taking it very seriously. He realizes that right now he doesn't have any power, and so will have to do what she wants. efforts to break the encryption codes will not be successful, nor will your attempts to assimilate me into your collective. Brave words. I've heard them before, from thousands of species across thousands of worlds since long before you were created. But now, they are all Borg. I am unlike any life form you have encountered before. The codes stored in my neural net cannot be forcibly removed. You are an imperfect being, created by an imperfect being. Finding your weakness is only a matter of time. Another cut, and we are taken into one of the really deep flaws of this movie. It cuts to Data, who is surrounded by the Borg. Now this is terrifying, initially. Data is absolutely helpless. Even though, for me, I always felt that he was just holding on to his restraints here, but whatever. The Borg are attempting to break his lockout algorithm, and it never really made sense to me that the Borg were using the tricorders. We are then taken into one of the really deep flaws of the movie. It cuts to Data, who is surrounded by Borg. This is terrifying. Data is absolutely helpless, even though for me it's Obvious he's just holding on to his restraints, but just ignore that. The Borg are attempting to break his lockout algorithm, and it never made sense to me that they were using tricorders. Borg technology is solidly more advanced than the Federation, to the point that the Borg can spawn new equipment from the nanotech. Presumably, the eyepieces and the augmented arms all have some form of scanning function. So why are they using inferior technology? Also, what exactly is a tricorder going to tell them? What are they going to get from its scans in the engineering deck? It's not a deal breaker or on par with other things that are going to come up, and I guess you could try breaking your back saying it's what they had at the time and they had to use it, 
but it's just odd. Ultimately, Data is confronted by a voice from on high, and this is my biggest issue. I cannot stand the Borg Queen. She fundamentally changes the Borg in every way. She also was not originally to be a part of the movie, to my understanding, but executives thought that the popcorn-eating audience needed a singular avatar to put the evilness upon. She makes little to no sense in the movie and adds nothing in my opinion. But anyway, this voice of not hundreds of drones talking with one singular voice, but a female that is mildly pleasant to hear, confronts him. He tells her that she won't get the information and she counters that he is imperfect, made by an imperfect being. We then see them begin drilling into his head. Again, that is definitely chilling, but imagine if it had been all Borg talking as one. How scary would that have been? Instead of one singular voice, it could have been hundreds of zombies that reverberated through the halls. But no, I guess we gotta get someone to bounce in Data's lap. So with Data in mortal danger and about to have sex, we go to Cochrane. We'll get into that more after this. Alright, finally. Got done with that video, ready to play some games. Here we go. There you are. You've decided to be a YouTuber and Someone started uploading videos, working 12 hours a day just to make ends meet. And all of a sudden, Who's talking? you didn't ask for this. You didn't choose this. Yet there it is. And you're treated no differently than being on Twitch. I am not eating chicken again. You're broke as fuck. What the hell? Okay, look, I know YouTube has been sucking. It's been hurting all content creators. Views and ads are down across the board, but I don't have to worry about it because I have the best audience in the world. They are going to patreon.com forward slash lore reloaded or hitting join on the video they're watching right now and becoming patrons or members for as low as a dollar a month. Cause I know they want to continue to see this great content. They won't do it. No one loves you. You're wrong. You're wrong. Right now, people are going to patreon.com forward slash lore reloaded and they're helping. Right now, patreon.com forward slash lore reloaded or hit the join button. They're going to ensure that this content continues. Yeah, I don't have to worry about a thing. Understand you correctly, Commander. A group of cybernetic creatures from the future have traveled back through time to enslave the human race, and you're here to stop them? That's right. Hot damn. You're heroic. <laughs> We're gonna prove it to you. <laughs> Jordy! There she is. Here we go. Beautiful. All right, take a look. Well, well, well. What have we got here? <laughs> I love a good peep show. <laughs> That's a trick. <laughs> How'd you do that? It's your telescope. That's our ship, the Enterprise. And, uh, Lily's up there right now? That's right. Can I talk to her? We've lost contact with the Enterprise. We don't know why yet. So, what is it you want me to do? Simple. Conduct your warp flight tomorrow morning, just as you planned. Why tomorrow morning? Because at 11 o'clock, an alien ship will begin passing through this solar system. Alien, you mean... Extraterrestrials? Now let me get this straight. Jordy, that has cybernetic eyes that is using a tricorder from the 24th century, isn't convincing enough for Cochrane. He has to see a little itty bitty object in the sky to believe what he's being told. Remember, a tricorder can tell you what anything is. It is ultimate magic. Well, at least on this Earth, there's nothing they have that could counter it. So if Zephram wanted to test this by hiding an object or doing something the Tricorder could figure out, that could be a very convincing way of getting him on board. But apparently that isn't enough. It's a spaceship. 
Hell, Cochrane is even skeptical of how they make the spaceship appear, asking how they did it. Which, again, wouldn't be as hard or as amazing as doing something with the tricorder. They also have phasers, weapons of magic that can start fire or stun people. Why are they looking at a ship when they have so many other ways of proving they are who they say they are? Look, I know people think that I hate this movie or I nitpick too much, but it's not like this isn't an easy fix. First, an easy fix to Jordy is just to add brief dialogue about his eyes. Jordy, or Riker, points out that Jordy's eyes are cybernetic. Zephyrin says that they are the most impressive he's seen, but cybernetics exist today and he's seen people that have fake eyes. Boom, we've got that addressed. They then either don't introduce the tricorder into the scene or use it instead. This wouldn't add that much more runtime as you would do it in lieu of looking for the Enterprise. But I get it, designing the Enterprise in real life does cost a lot of money, so you want to use it as much as possible, but there are ways around it so that you can continue to include the ship and it makes sense. Because at 11 o'clock an alien ship will begin passing through this solar system. Alien, you mean extraterrestrials? More bad guys? Good guys. Well, that's debatable. They're on a survey mission. They have no interest in Earth. Too primitive. Oh. Doctor. Tomorrow morning when they detect the warp signature from your ship and realize that humans have discovered how to travel faster than light, they decide to alter their course and they make first contact with Earth right here. Here? Uh, actually, over there. It is one of the pivotal moments in human history, Doctor. You get to make first contact with an alien race, and after you do, everything begins to change. Your theories on warp drive allow fleets of starships to be built and mankind to start exploring the galaxy. It unites humanity in a way that no one ever thought possible when they realize they're not alone in the universe. Poverty, disease, war, they'll all be gone within the next 50 years. But unless you make that warp flight tomorrow morning, before 11.15, none of it will happen. And you people, you're all astronauts on some kind of Star Trek. Roll credits. Look, Doc, I know this is a lot for you to take in, but... We're running out of time here. We need your help. What do you say? Why not? I am not impressed with this sequence. It's basically just talking Zephram into doing the launch. It adds the subtext about how Zephram really wasn't who they thought he was, that he's a drunk and that he was doing all this for money. And it is an intriguing look at how you shouldn't meet your heroes or how your heroes are just human and will make mistakes, which I guess is a good lesson for right now, but it adds little to the movie. But I don't know, what do you guys think? This is a horror incarnate. We see the security forces trying to hold off the Borg and absolutely failing, with more and more of them just becoming Borg. The officers do do some damage, getting a few shots off, even though the Borg have already adapted already, but whatever, and yet they continue to come at them. And it is absolutely chilling how once assimilated or the assimilation begins, the crew, even though they don't look like Borg yet, just walk with the other drones and wait in line to be operated on, to have their eyes ripped out and things inserted into them. And by the way, if you're watching this, this is how you do horror with eyes instead of what Picard decided to do. We also see a Starfleet team rush into, uh, I'm guessing that's a warehouse, 
And where at first it was brightly lit in the hallways, once they rush in behind them, there's nothing but red. But I guess it wouldn't look as good if it was brightly lit in the trailer, and they gotta get that trailer sequence, so it all makes sense. Some have asked why they not use force fields or blow the Borg out of space. At this point, I'm assuming that it's because of the computer lockout, that the Enterprise is basically neutral territory. Neither side can really use anything on the Enterprise until someone is able to access the computer itself. And that leads to finally seeing the security forces working smartly. It looks like the control deck's 26 up to 11. But when they took deck 11, they, they just stopped. Work have assimilated more than half the ship in a matter of hours. Why stop there? What is on deck 11? Hydroponics, stellar cartography, deflector control, no vital system. They would not have stopped there unless it gave them a tactical advantage. Return to your checkpoint. Send reports every 10 minutes. Right, sir. Runners and security officers trying to hold the ship, but most of them being assimilated up to deck 11. They aren't relying on communications and they are keeping checkpoints and falling back when they have to. We then have the well-known scene with Lily and Picard, which doesn't include New Zealand on the Earth, because I guess New Zealand doesn't exist in the Trek universe. Huh. Who knew a world where peace was possible and all the races would work together simply required the destruction of New Zealand? I never saw that, honestly. It is a sweet scene and a good way of bringing Lily and Picard together. Many have criticized the room, including how you get in and out of it. Honestly, I don't see why this is a big deal. There are multiple functions that this room could have, whether it be for research or because of some subsystem that necessitated the design with the room being there and they said, screw it, let's put a window in here in case someone wants to daydream. I don't know, I guess maybe I'm losing my touch, but it's just not worth really getting all that upset about. Stay tuned as we delve more into the Borg and failures of screenwriting. <laughs>